Lord, do it. Lord, do it. Lord, do it. Lord, do it for me. Teach them to hear say, Lord, because you know I don't want to do it. But since I have to do it, I will. It's a privilege and a blessing to be before you once again through the computer on the YouTubes. Uh, I'm excited to come forward into your dorm rooms, into your study room, into your cell phone or whatever device you kids will be using to view this, and you better be viewing it to help you understand hearsay. Um, I want you all to get the concepts of these rules. Well, there's one part memorization and there's another part comprehension. The UVAs of the world, they do a whale of a job getting to the memorization without ever really doing much in the way to get to that next step of comprehension. I want you all to comprehend these concepts so that when you have to be the explainer in chief and explain them, you'll be able to do so. And it is my prayer that this video will will edify your understanding so that we won't make the same mistakes tomorrow that we did yesterday. Okay? So, with all that being said, I will try not to be before you long, said every preacher ever, but just like every preacher ever, ever that might not be true. So, bear with me, all right? Um, trying to there we go all right so the for the fourth you'll see how I did there the first order of business is going to be uh, explaining a very uh, technical distinction non hearsay versus the hearsay exception we make this mistake quite often to my chagrin and we made it on Monday I guess that would be the 18th of November we made that mistake again during our objection drills and from this moment on I don't want to ever make it again we have to talk about what not hearsay is so that when we articulate it we aren't using jargon just for the sake of using it and by consequence end up making claims that are internally contradictory okay that detracts from our polish so we talk about being robot adjacent robots don't make conceptual mistakes like this we have to get this cleared up in our minds so what is non-hearsay? Non-hearsay is exactly what the etymology would suggest. It's not hearsay by definition. What definition? The definition of hearsay found in Rule 801C. So if you remember how the 801s break, break down, 801A defines what a statement is and a statement is an assertion of fact right you have 801 B which is a declarant the person who makes the statement you with me 801 C understand y'all with me is the what what you all have been trained to repeat whenever you hear that word. An out of court, uh oh, chest pain. An out of court statement offered for the truth of the matter asserted. 
that is the definition of hearsay, right? Let's talk about what that phrase, I'm going to abbreviate it, T-O-M, truth of the matter. What does that mean? Because we made this mistake on Monday when I asked somebody, what's the truth of the matter? And this is a classic response, so don't feel bad. Someone asks, what's the truth of the matter? And they say, well, the truth of the matter is the reason why we're in court today. No, no, no. That is not correct. You see that? The truth of the matter is not why we are trying the case. It's not, you know, that, that Jordan killed Parker or created a substantial risk that would have led to her death. It's none of those things. The truth of the matter asserted is the truth of the matter asserted in the statement. Okay, so this is when I have to put on my philosopher hat, y'all. Sorry. There was a law review article from uh, William and Mary Law. You understand? Where they break down exactly how do they, how to, uh, or how the author. Uh, argues we are to deduce or extrapolate the truth of the matter in a statement. And it's a very intention-based approach that I, by and large, agree with. So, in other words, you have a statement. Let's say a statement is, I went outside. You have the statement's semantic meaning. And you'll hear me use that word a lot. So what semantic meaning exactly, what the denotation of each, I guess, constituent word is and how uh, it comes to, what it comes to mean cumulatively. So semantically, it's the meaning of the phrase. So I went outside. What does that mean? It means I went outside. Right, It's not that complicated, and it sounds repetitive and redundant, but I need you to get it. So the semantic meaning of the phrase, I went outside, is that I went outside. I, being the utterer or the proponent of the statement, went, traveled to, outside. In this case, that's a preposition describing the placement of the pronoun or noun, in this case, me. I traveled to a position outside. Okay, that's the semantic meaning of the phrase. The truth of the matter asserted in the statement is that I indeed went outside. So you have its meaning. I went outside being offered to prove the truth of the matter. That the meaning of the statement is true. So you have meaning, which is different than truth, right? If the meaning is being used to prove the truth of the meaning, It's hearsay. I'm fresh off of reading a random epistemology paper that I was emailed yesterday for some reason. So this is going to get extra technical today. You're welcome. So if the meaning of the statement is being used to prove the truth of the meaning, then it's hearsay. What do I mean by that? If the statement... I went outside is being used to prove that I went outside. That's the hearsay. And that's the danger. That is illegible. But you'll be all right. Look at your neighbor say, you'll be all right. I don't hear y'all talking back to me. 
if the meaning of the statement is being used to prove the, the meaning, then it's hearsay. This is, the, this is really a circularity, and I hope that my resident philosophers, Leop and Anna, are going to be able to recognize that. This is a sort of circularity, uh, understand, that, that the rule is proscribing against. Not prescribing, but proscribing. FYI, that's the word of the day. Proscribing. Y'all Google that. Amen. I might ask y'all that. That might be my way of saying, seeing if you even watch the damn video. Okay. So, this is a circularity that the rule is trying to prevent. You're using the statement to prove the truth of the matter or the meaning of the statement. Okay. So if I went outside, it's being used to prove that, in fact, I did go outside. Then that's the sort of truth value that the rule is uh, proscribing against. That's offering that statement to prove the truth value uh, is exactly the sort of thing that the rule is prohibiting. Okay? I hope that's clear. That's what I mean by if the meaning, so the statement means I traveled somewhere, is being used to prove the truth of the meaning that indeed it is true that I traveled somewhere, then it's hearsay. All right, it's a circularity. It's you're using the statement to prove the statement. It's a form of question begging. That's another philosophical turn of phrase that you'll often hear kids is if for those of you all who are not in your right, right minds and decide that philosophy is what you want to do question big where you assert something through the premise and then use the premise to uh, prove the conclusion which is basically uh, the same thing as the premise So, it's a circularity that the rule is not allowing us to do. Okay? I hope that's clear. Let's take, for instance, let's take the same statement. Lord have mercy. I won't be before you long. Okay. The same statement. What if we're not offering it to prove the truth value? Or we're not offering it to prove its meaning? Okay. What if we're offering it to show that the declarant was lying? Mm So we're literally offering the statement to prove the opposite of what the statement would suggest. We're not offering it to show that the meaning, we're not offering the meaning of the statement to prove that the meaning was true. We're not offering the truth value of the statement to prove, or we're not offering the statement to prove its truth value. We're offering the statement to prove Precisely that it was wrong and that the utterer or the declarant knew that it was wrong. Then that's not hearsay. It's not an exception to hearsay. It's not hearsay. Why? Because we're offering it to show not that the statement is true, but that the statement was false. And declarant knew it. And so, by definition, it's not hearsay.
So let's say I went outside was an alibi. Let's make it an alibi. You see that? Did I spell that right? Al okay. Let's pray I did. If I if I offer the statement I went outside as an alibi when I was really in the house the whole time where the murder took place, and I offered that and the prosecution offered that statement, they're obviously not offering it to prove that I was in fact outside. They're offering it for the exact opposite effect, to show that the statement was untrue and that they have proof that somehow that the statement was untrue and therefore they're offering the statement not to show that the statement was true but that the declarant was lying and, and, and that's evidence that his alibi really isn't effective. So by definition, if it's not being offered for the truth, then it's not hearsay. Why? Because the statements, because the definition of hearsay, what is it kids? It's been beat into your heads by now. It's an out-of-court statement offered for the truth of the matter. Another way to think of it is you're offering it to prove the truth of the matter. It's not the case here. That you're doing that. You're not offering it to prove the truth of the matter that I went outside. You're not offering the statement, I went outside, to prove that I went outside in this context. So, because you're not offering it to prove the truth of the matter, it's not hearsay. Because it doesn't meet the definition of hearsay. Okay? That sounds pedantic, and it sounds condescending. Yeah, of course, it's it sounds like a tautology. Of course, it's not hearsay if it doesn't meet the definition of hearsay. You all laugh at me and think that it's condescending. But when you argue it, you turn around and you make mistakes, especially when it comes to arguments like this. Subsequent action, effect on the listener, notice. By the way, I know how I always talk about how these two things are, uh, by and large, the same. So technically, subsequent action is, well, let me erase it then, so I'm not misleading you about that and rewrite it. That'd be a good idea. Nice job, Jabari. Anyway, effect on the listener. So subsequent action is a type of effect. So in other words, think of effect on the listener as a broader umbrella under which subsequent action is a constituent, for lack of a better phrase. So subsequent action is a type of effect along with notice or knowledge. Okay. Impeachment. Whenever you're impeaching somebody, Meaning, you know, showing a prior inconsistent statement. You're showing a contradiction. You're not offering statements, i.e. the prior statement, the affidavit, the deposition. You're not offering those prior statements to show that the prior statements were true. You're offering those prior statements simply to show that it's different. That the prior statement is different than what the testimony is, or then what the testimony the declarant is now giving was. or That was terrible syntax. You're offering the prior statement simply to show that it was different, that it is different than the testimony that the declarant is giving. Different from the testimony that the declarant was giving. There you go. I'm not stroking out, I promise. If I was stroking out, you'd hear a siren in the background. Okay. So, these things here, when you're arguing for subsequent action, when you're arguing that a statement goes to the listener's knowledge, when you're arguing you know, that you're using the statement for impeachment purposes, those, those uses are not truth usage uses. You're not offering the statements to prove the truth of anything. 
You're not offering the statements to prove the truth of the matter asserted in the statements. You're offering them for other non-truth uses, which are permitted by the rule, or probably more precisely put. These uses, these uses of statements are not particularly prohibited by the rule. There you go. And so when you argue subsequent action, you shouldn't argue that subsequent action is a hearsay exception because it's not an exception. It's just not hearsay. What's the difference between an exception and something being not hearsay? We'll talk about that in a second, but it should be clear. When you argue that a statement goes to knowledge, it's not an exception to hearsay. It's just not hearsay. Why is it not hearsay? Because it doesn't meet the necessary and sufficient uh, definitional requirements of hearsay. Why? Because the statement isn't being offered to prove that its meaning is true. You're not offering the statement to prove its truth value. You're not offering the statement to prove the truthhood of the statement itself. You're offering the statement to show that somebody was made aware of a particular claim. Someone heard a claim that the claim was believed by the, uh, by the listener. That's not to say that the claim itself was true. If I tell you two plus two is four, let me, let me talk about knowledge for a second here, because this is weird. Think of knowledge more as notice or belief, because this throws me off all the time because, again, the philosophers would tell you that knowledge is a justified true belief. And if you're offering a statement to show knowledge, then it entails that you would be offering it for its truth value. But that's when we use knowledge here in the hearsay context, that's not exactly what we mean. Knowledge in this context, is really something closer to notice or belief. When you're offering a statement to show not that the statement is true, you're not using the statement to prove the truthhood or the truth of the statement. Uh, you're offering the statement rather to show that the listener heard it and believed it. Okay, so y'all see that? So that that's the difference. Is you're not when you're offering a statement to show knowledge, you're not offering it to show that the statement itself is true. You're offering the statement to show that whoever heard it believed it and acted based on that underlying belief. That underlying belief, which was formed as a result of, as a byproduct of, their having heard a particular utterance or statement. Okay? I hope that's clear. Okay? So... When you're offering something for knowledge, you're not offering it to show the truth of the matter. When you're offering something for subsequent action, you're not offering it to show the truth of the matter in the statement. You're offering it for a non, these are non-truth uses, which wouldn't, and if it's not being offered for the truth, so this is, I'll just write it. I'm sorry, y'all. So, yeah. if not for the truth, then it's not hearsay. Okay? Simple and plain. It's not an exception. If you're offering a statement for the effect on the listener, it's not hearsay. It's not an exception. Why do I keep making a big deal out of it? Because, follow me now. Look at your neighbor say, he's almost done. He's almost done. Glory to God. 
exceptions to hearsay. An exception is it's hearsay, but it comes in for another reason. Okay? It's hearsay. Glory to God. It's hearsay because it's being offered for the truth of the matter asserted in the statement. But it comes in for another reason. So in real life, ignore these case names, but this is just for teaching purposes. Dutton v. Evans, sorry, or let's see, Ohio v. Roberts. There's another one, uh, a more recent one, Crawford v. Washington, about, it's not dying declaration, it was witness unavailable um, because of death. Uh, yeah, it was a witness unavailable because of death. And yeah, all right, and it was testimony from a previous hearing. Right, it was a long story. But anyway, all of these cases bring up things like indica of reliability, uh, reliability. Y'all with me? They bring up things like particular guarantees of trustworthiness. Okay. And that hearsay exceptions are grounded. Exceptions come from I'll just put are grounded in these things. So why don't I just, I don't know. Y'all flow with me. I hope y'all get it. Y'all know I'm crazy by now. You see, an indica of reliability or a guarantee of trustworthiness, hearsay exceptions are either through the common law and that they've been around forever or you know, they've been codified as they are on the federal level. The hearsay exceptions, the basis, the basis of the hearsay exception is that, or any hearsay exception, is that there are a particular set of circumstances which ensures that the statement uh, is reliable. As we've talked about before, the danger of hearsay is that it can become here? He said, she said. He said, she said. If you use nothing but out of court statements to prove a case or try to disprove a case, one of the dangers is that it can very quickly become a game of telephone. You have the person who perceives something who then gave their account to somebody else who then has to not only give the person's account who saw it but accurately remember his own account of what the account was, and so on and so forth. So levels of hearsay remove us from direct eyewitness accounts. And so that is the danger, one of the dangers of hearsay. Okay, And so the rule is there to protect us from these dangers. The exceptions are there because they are grounded in a set of circumstances which somehow ensure the validity or protect the, the, the reliability of the evidence from these dangers, by and large. Okay, I hope that makes sense. So the hearsay exceptions are there because for whatever reason, in the situation spelled out by each exception, the statements are somehow more reliable than they would be if they would not 
if they did not fit into said exception or any other exception. If it was just general hearsay that wasn't conformable to an exception, then it would retain the dangers and therefore uh, uh, be unworthy of admissibility and would therefore need to be excluded for purposes of, of, uh, of the rule or by virtue of the rule. Okay, so I'm doing a lot of flailing. I hope that you all understand that I need you all to get this because hearsay is complicated, but I still contend that it's not as complicated as character evidence. That is still the hardest rule. Fight me. All right, anyway, come back. So the exceptions to hearsay are ground are there because under the circumstances that they spell out, the statements are more reliable than they otherwise would be if it was just general hearsay or hearsay that didn't conform to uh, an exception. All right. So what are the top three hearsay exceptions? Okay, keep in mind that exceptions to hearsay are in rule, I'm going to write FRE, FRE stands for Federal Rules of Evidence, by the way. I have a feeling that somebody didn't know that. I'm not calling no names. Okay, but FRE, uh, 803, Federal Rule of Evidence, 803, that's where the exceptions to hearsay are. And the first one, 803.1 through 803.3. How can you remember it? Very simply. When you go to the hospital, sometimes you need a PET scan. So, PET scan. What do you mean? How is that relevant, Bishop? Well, let me explain it to you. So, what does the P and PET stand for? It stands for present sense impression. Okay. What's the E stand for? An excited utterance. This is y'all's favorite for some reason. Uh, the uh, T stands for a then existing mental state. Uh oh. Okay, spell. All right, y'all with me? Now, so what do these things mean? Well, I'm going to write the corresponding number for the corresponding exception and then explain it. So the present sense impression, it's a statement describing an event or condition. Immediately after or during the declarant perceived it. Look at your neighbor say, are you with me? Are you following the black man? Ask him. Look at your neighbor say, neighbor, are you following the black man? I hope so. So in other words, you know, this is Day Day's favorite example. Think of Obama. The, the Duke-Kentucky basketball game last year, like early on in the college basketball season, Zion Williamson, like just a few minutes into the first quarter, when he's still a freshman. Well, no, was that? He was a freshman. He's in his Nikes. He's already, you know, basically, he's already on the way to being the number one overall draft pick. He's 
playing around, and his shoe breaks. Like, butt, literally bust open, and his toe hangs out. And Obama is sitting courtside. Obama sees it and immediately utters, his shoe broke. This is a statement Offer for the truth of the matter asserted. Remember, because it's, it's hearsay. It's being used to prove its truth value. So by definition, it is hearsay. What definition? Definition that an out-of-court statement is a truth of the matter asserted. Uh, what did I just say? The definition that a statement is being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. That hearsay is an out-of-court statement being offered for the truth of the matter asserted. It's hearsay to prove that the statement his shoe broke is being used to prove the fact that his shoe is broken or that his shoe broke at that moment. But it comes in because it's a present sense impression. Obama was there to see the shoe breaking and immediately declares out of court that his shoe broke. Y'all see that? I hope so. That was a lot of rambling. Let me see. Now I gotta add another page because I'd be right. Look at your neighbor say he's almost done. Now, two. It's excited utterance. I'm gonna leave a link to that. GIF, by the way, because it's actually a really funny GIF about Obama, uh, Obama saying his shoe broke. So, from now on, whenever it's a present sense impression, we're going to say his shoe broke, and that ought to be your keyword as to what the exception is. All right? So, number two, the excited utterance is statement describing An event. Well, Jesus. A startling event. Or condition. Okay. Oh, Sean Doe. And... It was made while under the stress. This is a big requirement. So in other words, an excited utterance is not someone saying something excitedly. I'm going to write that down because I feel it in my spirit. Because this happens every year. And you'll hear other teams do it. And when they do it, you have to punish them for it. Call out bad my trial. Remember? This is not saying something excitedly. It's something stressful happens. You see someone get shot in the head. That's pretty startling. When you yell out, you know, I guess, uh, you know, Franklin shot it or something like that. Let's say, I don't know, the gunman's name is Franklin. St follow me here. I know this is pathetic. Let's say you see someone get shot in the head. That's a startling event. And then, you know, you just yell out, you know, Franklin shot it or something. And you offer that statement for its truth value because it's hearsay. It comes in not because it's not hearsay. It comes in under an exception. It's hearsay, but it comes in for another reason. That reason being 8032, an excited utterance. Because it's a statement made describing a startling event. So the statement itself describes what happened to startle you. And the statement is made while you are still startled. Okay. So, you know, to kind of make these two, uh, I guess exceptions uh, make them more comprehensible now, I'm reading a, a real life case right now called uh, uh, United States v Lance 
Lentz. Yeah, I almost said Wentz, as in the Eagle starting quarterback, Carson Wentz. W-E-N-T-Z. Instead of that, it's L-E-N-T-Z. Lentz. So, in that case, uh, basically... A husband is accused of killing his wife. They had a, he was very abusive to her for a long time. It was a federal case, obviously, as you can tell by the fact that the United States is in it. Um, tried in the Eastern District of Virginia in that court in 2002. Yeah, 2002. And it's, it deals with a whole bunch of hearsay exceptions. Um, all three of these, actually. Uh, and the way that uh, it helpfully describes what's going on and, and why the hearsay exceptions are there is because of the spontaneity of the statement. With little opportunity... for uh, reflection or ability to fabricate so another thing about these exceptions is that you know it's immediate or the immediacy of the statement. That's what makes it more reliable. So instead of it being a cold and calculated utterance being used to, I guess, rig the system in a sense or take advantage of a loophole in the law, they're more visceral. Something in the case of the excited utterance, something stressful happens. And, uh, right after it happens. Spontaneity. The stressful event is obviously unplanned. No one plans to undergo damn near anything that's startling because that's the, by definition, that's the essence of what something is or must be in order to be startling, that it has to be spontaneous enough because if you see it coming, then it doesn't startle you. So it's a spontaneous event that pro provokes an immediate reaction that's so immediate that it's rather instinctive. It's not calculated, it's not planned, and it's and your reaction is so immediate that you have little time to think about it, think about a way to fabricate it, or you know, misremember something. Because, you know, anyone who knows anything about human memory, so basically all of us, you know that the farther away you get from it in there, the more you know, cognitive biases, self-serving biases come in to uh, influence your, your uh, how do I say, influence your recollection of events and uh, hamper your, and the more those biases hamper your ability to accurately uh, recall them and uh, detail them. So instead of having that effect uh, in the hearsay statement, the rule proscribes against it. There's your vocabulary word for the for the day, and it its exceptions. These two exceptions, especially, uh, are there so that the statement is made immediately. There has to be a very small time horizon between statement. And uh, and the event that prompts it, so that it's more reliable, without the uh, ability to fabricate, throwing it off, making it less reliable. That was a bunch of that wasn't that wasn't my finest hour in terms of polished articulation, but I hope you were able to gather my meaning. I'm not re-recording it because I'm already frustrated with my computer. All right, so lift your hands. Look at your neighbor say he's almost done. This is the last one. 
and then I'm going to release you. So the then existing mental state is exactly what the title implies. You have the mental mental state, physical, Jesus. You have an emotional state, Included in this is bodily condition, by the way. So expressions of pain. My knee hurts. If you're offering the statement to prove that indeed the knee does hurt, or did hurt at the time, that's hearsay. And it's brought in through hearsay exception 8033. You understand? So bodily condition is in there. And then the big three that are used, probably overused in my trial. Motive, intent, or plan. Okay. So we brought this up with our, uh, what you call it, activity. Our uh, evidence entering activity on November the 18th in that practice. So statements like, I am going to kill that little girl, Parker Page. Why is my handwriting so bad? I think I'm off the Okay. That statement. If it's being offered to show that indeed the declarant was thinking of a plan or thinking of a way to kill Parker Page or was intending to kill Parker Page, that's hearsay. But it's brought in under the hearsay exception, 8033, because it goes to a motive, uh, a desire, it goes to an intent or the plan. Now, a few things about this. It has to be the declarant's mental state. The declarant cannot simply talk. I'm going to star this to infinity because people, Lord have mercy, you talk about bad teams, they don't get this distinction. It's very important. That's a big caveat. Y'all with me? Stay with me. I know it's been long and I want to be done too, but I got to make this plain upon tables. The declarant, you understand, the declarant, the declarant has to make a statement about his own or her own mental state. It can't just be person A describes person B's mental state. The, the mental state being delved into by the out-of-court statement offered for its truth has to, has to, has to, has to pertain to the declarant's own mental state. Can't just be a loose affirmation about what somebody else is feeling. And that makes sense, right? Because think about what the rule for speculation or against speculation is. You wouldn't allow a witness in court to talk about the mind state of someone else or the mental state of someone else, right? So then why would you create a hearsay exception that allows someone to do that very thing outside of court and then bringing in the court through a hearsay exception? That makes no sense. So, of course, the, the, the mental state exception here is very narrowly tailored to prevent exactly that kind of speculative danger that is precluded by the Rule 602. Okay? We've gone over 602, so y'all should not be going, huh? Well, you heard me say 602. All right. We almost done. Look at your neighbor say we almost done. The hour is far spent. One an additional caveat. Statements of memory.
cannot be used to prove the fact remembered. Y'all see that? Huh? Y'all not talking back. That's all right. So the statements of memory cannot be used to prove the fact remembered. So if you said, you know, well, I'm not going to write it down. If you said, I remember when Trump bribed the Ukrainians, that's a statement of memory. And, oh, Lord, no. Uh-uh, Lord, help him. Thank you. So while a statement of memory would be, I guess, a mental state, it can't be used to prove the content of the memory as being true. Okay, so simply that would be too broad of an exception because then I guess somebody could theoretically game this rule and get in almost any underlying assertion of fact by just simply saying, I remember and allowing that to come in through this hearsay exception. I can get in almost any out of court statement if this is true or if this is permissible by saying, I remember. I remember when Trump bribed the Ukrainian. I remember when OJ killed that broad. I remember when the government faked the moon landing. All of those statements would, would come in under that exception if, I hope you all listening, if you all cut the video off right there, that would be unfortunate because then you would be severely misled. But all of those statements would come in if that exception or this caveat didn't exist. The statement of memory cannot be used to prove the fact remembered. Okay? And it's more, 8033 is narrowly tailored just to be simply reflective of whatever the mental state was of the declarant, the declarant's mental state at the time. It can't be used to backdoor in memories. Okay? So we've gone over today the difference between non-hearsay and exceptions to hearsay. Remember, if something is being used for a non-truth use, either for the effect on the listener, subsequent action, knowledge, impeachment, okay, those things are not hearsay. So don't say exception to hearsay, subsequent action. It's not an exception. It's just not hearsay. Why is it just not hearsay? Because it doesn't meet the definitional requirement for hearsay. Well, Jabari, that's condescending. Obviously that follows. That makes sense. Yeah, but when you articulate it, a lot of the times with your fillers and your your, your nervous tics, one of the things you like to do is add more words than you need to. And for whatever reason, with hearsay, it's a very popular and rather easy maneuver to fall into, or mistake, or malaprop to fall into to say exception to hearsay. Well, you don't mean exception. It's just not hearsay. And the same thing here. When you say something is an exception to hearsay, it is hearsay, but it comes in for a different reason. So don't say something falls under an exception, like one of these, and is therefore not hearsay. That's wrong. It is hearsay, but it's admissible because it falls under the exception. Yes, hearsay is not admissible generally, but that doesn't mean that there aren't particular examples where it can come in. And so far as there are well-grounded exceptions with indica of reliability, or guarantees of trustworthiness, they come in. And these rules are like eight o are in the 803s, these exceptions. They're in the 803s. Present sense impression, excited utterance, then existing mental, emotional, physical condition, all sorts of things like that. Okay? Soon we're going to get to 803.4 and 803.6. Why don't y'all look them up? Just look them up. Not that hard. You can teach yourself. Look at God. But as for right now, 
I pray that the peace of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit rest, rule, and abide henceforth and forevermore. You may go in peace.